Welcome to this week's edition of In the Clubhouse with EMD. I'm Andy Kirikides, joined by a special guest for this week's edition, uh, Coach Jonathan Grasse. You've heard him on many podcasts before. Pleasure to have him on here again this week. How we doing? Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, guys. Excited to, uh, you know, fill in for, for Coach Glass here. Um, talk about some new age recruiting. Yeah, there is. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the transfer portal is on and popping, as the kids would say. Um, I think roughly 1,500-ish underclassmen. This is not counting grad students. So how it works, we'll break this down real quick. On June 3rd, if you're a scholarship baseball player who has eligibility left and you're not a grad transfer, you are then eligible to officially enter your name into the transfer portal. Grad students, Division II and Division Three players or non-scholarship players are able to enter their names into the portal at any time, all right? Everybody knew there was going to be grad guys in the portal. Those guys are going to get scooped up one year. They're not on the books that long. Most of them got 200 at-bats, a couple hundred innings, you know, 100, 100 or so innings under their belt. They're the guys who can come in and give you that boost. The thing that's a little bit different about this year is the sheer amount of underclassmen that are entering the portal. And I think what we're seeing this year is more indicative of what the future looks like. And I think it is flipping college recruiting on its head. And we're going to take a few minutes to talk about that because I know we both have some thoughts. We've both been on the phone with dozens of coaches from all different levels of college baseball. And there's no way around it. The transfer portal is causing a extremely quick evolution of how college coaches are going about recruiting uh, moving forward. So I'm going to kick it over to you to, to, to give some thoughts here and then we'll see where this takes us. Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, obviously what I do and what you guys do at, you know, the EMD is, is our job is to, you know, constantly be in touch with college coaches, all different levels, understand the, you know, the pulse of what, you know, what's going on, better serve our players, better serve, you know, everybody involved, families. Um, and like you said, like it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, and I joked about it on when we first started, it's new age recruiting. Um, it's here to stay. Um, the one thing I think this year that I noticed and I've seen the most of is, is that nobody really is immune to the portal because the top level guys, which has not really changed, but the top level, the SEC, they've gone out and they, they have NIL money and they're going out and paying the best players to, to go there. But what we've seen this year is, is, is that. Not only are the top level play, top level teams going and getting those players, but now you're seeing players go into the portal that some are going, getting told to be go, go into the portal. Hey, you're not good enough to play at this level. Some are going because they want to try. Hey, I want to go up a level. So, like we'll call it low le- low level or mid level division one. Want to go to high level division one? Okay. But now we're also seeing and and. You know, we talked about this earlier, but you know now you see these Division Two and Division Three players are also going in with a ton of success at that given level, and now they're going in, and now they're trying to go mid level Division One, high division, whatever it is. But every school is now affected by the portal. No matter how good you are, no matter how good your program is, every level is affected by the portal. For whatever reason, whether you're putting players into it, whether you're taking kids out of it, nobody is immune or can say, hey, we're not really interested in the portal. Maybe the eight Ivy League schools might be the only eight, but everybody else is being affected by the portal one way or another. And I think it's it's just a crazy time. And, and, and I said this before, and I said it in 2020 when you know guys weren't able to go out and I first got out of college coaching if you're a high school player or a high school family of a player that you know wants to play in college you better have people on your side that that college coaches trust because it is harder 
than ever to be recruited as a high school athlete right now. And if you don't have guys like EMD, you know, our guys are elite. Like if you don't have guys on your side that can help you and advocate for you, you're going to be in a world of trouble because there's just not that many players getting recruited right now at, at high school level. And the ones that are, are have close relationships with people that college coaches trust. Yeah, it's the thing that's jumped out to me in the the first week of this is that you're seeing you're seeing premium underclassmen leave premium programs. That was shocking to me. Where you're seeing guys who played at ACC schools at top 25 programs, got innings, were successful that are leaving those schools because they know they can go get paid, right? And I'm not, I am not casting shade. I'm not throwing shade on anybody here because if you judge an 18 or a 19 year old kid on the decision they make, I just think that that's some, some weak sauce. Um, that's the thing that's been different for me. I kind of always expected that you were going to see guys who were at that mid to lower level of division one, who go and have really good years go into the portal because they want to move up a level or you see kids at the back end of ACC or SEC rosters that don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. They, they go into the portal because they want an opportunity to play. I figured that that was how it was going to go, but I'm definitely shocked when you see marquee names at marquee programs jump into the portal because they think they got a chance to go make money. And I think that's, that's the reality that we live in right now. And, and if you're a high school player, it is more and more important to seek out a school for everything but the label and the jersey that they wear and that you do your homework on the coaching staff, on the education, on the ability to develop, that you're going to be happy at that school. Because the way it's working now, I think that for the most part, I'll lowball it for my original statement. But I believe that you're going to see high school recruiting caught by 40% because they don't have to. If there's 1,500 kids going into the portal every single June who have already proven themselves to be either recruitable or competent at the college level, those college coaches, specifically at the higher levels, they don't have a reason to take a chance on a high school kid that's projectable. They're going to take chances on high school kids that they think have an opportunity to impact their program immediately because the trend that we're seeing is that if you don't play, they leave. Not everybody, but a lot of freshmen who went to ACC, SEC, Big 12 schools, Big 10 schools who went in there and didn't play, they're leaving. So if you're a college coach, if you think of it this way, why would I bring in kids that I know that are going to leave? So now my filter for what is acceptable in my program becomes that much finer because instead of bringing in a 10 or a 12 high school class, I might only bring in five or six high school kids. And those five or six guys are going to be core guys for me over the next three years. And I'm not going to take those fringe guys. I'm not going to take the guy that I think has a chance in a year and a half. Like I need ready-made dudes because I can go get them. You'll get them wherever you want. I mean, there's 1,500 kids in the portal. And if you're stubborn in this process and you don't take the feedback that the baseball world is giving you and you don't live in the reality of what recruiting is now, you're going to find yourself in a tough situation at the back end of your recruiting process. And that's a hard thing for some people to hear. And there's going to be some tough moments that our people are going to go through because they're going to have aspirations of being an ACC guy and the baseball world's going to punch them in the face and they, it's going to tell them you're not. The most important thing is go find a place where you have an opportunity to compete for a job early and don't worry about the bumper sticker, right? There's so much good college baseball across the board. You saw that in the regionals that – you don't have to play at a marquee school in a marquee conference to get noticed, and you don't have to play at those places to get developed. And the people who are stubborn 
and they think that recruiting is the way that it was 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, you're going to get lost. You're going to get lost. And you need, to your point, you need people who have connections and are trusted. And just as importantly, you need somebody who is not going to fill you full of hot air because that's what you want to hear. You need somebody who's going to look you in the face and go, hey, man, you can't play at that level right now. These are the schools that we need to look at. These are the schools you need to focus on because these are the schools that like you. And you need to find the one that's the best fit for you. Because on the flip side of this, if you go and ball out as a freshman and a sophomore, you can make that jump. But if you don't play, you ain't getting recruited out of the portal either. So it's a it's a different world. It's a different game. And you have to recognize the reality of it and not live in a world where you th- of what you think should be. You have to recognize what's actually in front of you in this process and, and make sure that you're going about it from a place of knowledge and not from a place of guessing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said earlier, like you, you have to have people that you trust. Before I would do anything as a high school family right now, I would say, how many college coaches have you talked to in the last week? And if it's if they can't give you a straight answer, then you need to go find somewhere else to to spend your money. Whether it's team, whether advisors, whatever it is, you need to because if you if you can't give a straight answer on how many college coaches you've talked to in the last week, then you haven't talked to enough. <laughs> that's that's all I'll say. And the way the process is going, it's it's just you know it's. It's just different than it was. You know, I mean, me and Andy talk about this all the time. Like I said, all the time I got out in, in 2020, I think Andy, you got out a little bit before that, but like, it's a different occupation than what I did. What these guys do now is a different occupation than, than the job that I had five years ago. And it's the same title, but it's just a different occupation with dealing with NIL, with dealing with transfers, with dealing with, you know, ro- the roster management stuff. It's, it's just a different animal now. Um, and unless you are working with somebody and, and have somebody in your corner that knows the ins and outs of what's going on in the business and, and how those coaches are actually dealing with it, then you're with the wrong group you're, and you're with the wrong people because it is different. You need people that you can trust that can advocate for you because it used to be there was X number of high school players that were getting recruited every year. But now you're adding... You know, and like Andy said, fifteen hundred. I think it's like two thousand if you count underclassmen, or maybe even more. But you're you're adding two thousand more kids to the pot because they have to figure out. Okay, well, we only, we need eight players. We need eleven players. Well, we can get six transfers now. We only need five high school kids. Well, now that pot, that number of of players that was getting recruited just shrunk by five times three hundred at the Division One level. Times I think it's like 211 or something like that at the division two. I mean, you're talking about that's 5,000 kids, you know, difference right there. You know, like you're talking about a huge number of players that would have been recruited, but aren't anymore because, Hey, I'm going to recruit a transfer. You got to go somewhere that you got to work with somebody and play for somebody that can tell you, Hey, this is not an option. We need to move to this. Because it's it's a huge deal, and like and like I said, the math just shows you right there that many less kids are getting recruited. I said five thousand twenty five hundred. Um, sorry, but you know what I mean. Like it's th- that's just Division One and Division Two, and never. And then you add on Division Three, which I believe has the most amount of schools. I think it's like three hundred and fifty or or three hundred seventy, something like that. There's just a lot of a different. It's just a different way to recruit because the numbers are getting shrunk because of the portal, because there's so many kids going into the portal and so many of those kids are taking spots that were traditionally filled by high school players. Just the reality of it. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I mean, I think it's raised the floor to get your foot in the door at all, right? The the amount of division three guys that I've talked to in the last year or so, Every single one of them has said, like, we're getting a better player because of the portal. So there's a lot of kids who three or four years ago 
were probably scholarship Division One guys who were getting passed over, and they're ending up at Division Three schools. They're ending up at Division Two schools because those Division One guys are doing a lot of their recruiting in the portal. Um, so that the the bar has been set a lot higher just to get your foot in the door at any level. Never mind being a Division One scholarship guy. Um, and that's a reality of it too, is that you don't get to play college baseball just because you want to. And you got to recognize how competitive the the field is here. And here's another little thing to think about to marinate on. There's a lot of talk that they're cutting the rosters back down. That they're gonna eventually remove the cap on the number of scholarships or the percentage that you can put. And they're going to get rid of counters, but they're going to drop the rosters back down to 35. All right. Well, if they do that, there's 1,500 kids going into the portal who don't have an option because you have to cut them. They don't get to leave. You have to cut your roster down. So that when that year happens, it's going to be a, a complete cluster. But if they shrink the rosters, like I've heard, is what people are proposing or how they think they might potentially move forward here in the next couple of years. It's going to get even. It's going to get even crazier because every kid is in the portal, and this is an important thing to understand as a parent and as a player. Every kid in the portal at some point was deemed good enough to be a Division One player. You're already a disadvantage because somebody somewhere has already signed off on that kid being good enough. Some of them have numbers to prove that they belong at that level. You're up against that, and if you're not open minded. If you're not honest about where you sit and you don't have good people in your corner, you're relying on being exceptional in order to get noticed. And that's a hard thing to rely on. Anything else you got on that, Coach? I think we we kind of nailed it right there, to be honest with you. It's the wild, wild west, folks. It's not a scare tactic by any means. It's not. You can, you can still play college baseball, but I think the the big message here is recognize what the landscape is, and you can use it to your advantage. The people who who listen, the people who take feedback, and the people who are smart about how they go through this process can still do really, really well. Um, and don't just rely on being a good player who plays down at the world would bat in Georgia. Um, get some people in your corner that can help make sure you're educated on the topics and understand the landscape that you're, that you're trying to operate in. Yeah. You're dead on with that, man. Dead on. You can't just rely on being a good player anymore. There's, there's just too many players out there. There's too many different things that, you know, coaches can go to. Don't, don't just turn yourself into a number or an email address that just sends video because you need, you're going to need help throughout it. Whether, like I said, you just, you need people that you can trust that can help you through the process. Spot on, my friend. Well, with that, we will depart. Thank you for listening, everybody. As usual, tune in next week. We will talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening this week. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and smash that like button for us. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at EMD Baseball. If you want to find out what me and Keith do to help families and players navigate the recruiting process, go ahead and check us out on emdbaseball.com. Take a few minutes to check out our new online academy. I promise you'll get some good information out of that. Thanks again for listening. Check in with you next week.